just talk about a channel that should terrify Airbnb. And that channel is called Booking.com. Europe, Booking.com dominates the market. Even though Airbnb came into Europe, here's some stats for you. In 2021, Airbnb had 48% of the property management share of OTA volume. In 2023, that dropped to 41%. So Booking.com is now in a more dominant position than Airbnb. And it's, it's probably the, uh, the best stock in the travel sector uh, over the last 15 years. No question about that. Coming for you, Barbara. Warning, you're entering the line of fire. You're tuned into Straight Fire VR Podcast, a podcast for vacation rental insiders. We take aim at the topics facing the industry and provide blunt takes on short-term rental market. Proceed to listening at your own risk. Entering the line of fire, we have two guests today, both in the vacation rental world and the podcast world. Adam Norco, Vice President of Business Development and Growth at Travel Advantage Network, as well as the co-host of the Art of Hospitality podcast, also, today we have Scott Pisano, president of Travel Advantage Network and the fellow co host at Art of Hospitality Podcast. I'm Heather Macias Milo, executive producer. Here to open fire on the latest targets facing the industry is our host, Steve Milo. Steve, when you are ready, take aim. Hey, thank you, Heather. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Adam. And uh, we wish Miriam uh, the best for getting better. She's uh, off sick today but recovering and we hope to have her next week um we wanted to talk to scott and adam in particular about a couple uh breaking news stories um because they've both been in the industry a long time um and i think they both have some strong thoughts they also have their own podcast so scott i'm going to kind of start with picasa just released their third quarter earnings on november 7th it was a mixed report with far more bad news than good news. Sent you both kind of an article from uh, Skiff. But the headline news was that they, quote, had higher levels of churn than uh, anticipated, which means more owners leaving the, the program. And just for note, they had um, announced back in um, third quarter 2022 that their churn rate was 20% a year. So if they're having more than 20% churn a year, that that's pretty bad. But I'm just curious, you, you've you taken a look at some of the information they've published. What are your thoughts on the Vocasa three-quarter uh, earning call? Yeah, Steve, it, it, it's it's odd, right? Because I, I honestly thought that some plan of what was next was going to happen before now. And and you look at it, right? And, and I'm like you, I, I see the mixed results, but... I don't see what the exit ramp is, right? I mean, and we've had a lot of conversation about this. I mean, it looks like an unwind needs to happen, right? In 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 part or full. But what I can't gather, Steve, is how do they offload the operations, right? How do they get rid of the the ground game, right? The the local operators and and put it back in the, the hands of someone that, that can operate it. I mean, I'll say this. I'm I'm critical of them. I don't like the way they the way they do business. I think they are pushing this as a commodity business. But but the other side of it is they're actually when you look at owner to owner, they can actually perform well in some cases. And you know, in in our market at Social City in Delaware, and they came off the traditional seven night. They came off the Saturday to Saturday and actually have performed well with it. And again, this is a market that people would have said, "Oh, you can never do that." But they are they've picked up about 30% revenue when you compare it to to the old way. So so there's you can look in and go, man, there's a few things that they do right, but then they're so disastrous on the stuff that they're not good at, it really eats into to them showing any type of success. So I just as I'm looking at this, Steve, I think what I'm trying to focus on or is what does the exit look like? Right? How how does this thing wrap up or unwind? Well, it's a good question. Uh, something we've certainly talked about at the VMA bar. Um, I've been on record saying they're going to sell at some point. Um, I have thought they would have sold by now to private equity that would buy effectively the property management business. And to your point, they would keep the technology piece and try to build a quote unquote US version of Guesty. 
whether that could be accomplished or not, I have no idea. But that that's my guess how they're they're going to try to handle this. But but Adam, since Scott Breon is not here, who's famously the Vacasa uh, defender online, wh what what do you think is uh, anything that you read that was positive that Vacasa relayed in their earnings call? Well, it's interesting, and and Steve, I'm I'm sort of in your camp, and it's it's funny because we we've seen this play out before, right? We saw it with Resort Quest, and it's it's very similar. And and the uh, the way that you just discussed the potential exit is exactly what Resort Quest ended up doing. They started they started to offload back into the local markets, back to the property management companies, and then they sold off the tech side. Now, is Vacasa positioned to do that? I, I think there's a a deeper discussion that would need to be had. I think that it's it's uh, relatively Easy is not the right word, but at least a, a simple process to push the management operation side back to those local markets. The technology side, I mean, I think that's the the bigger question in my mind. Is that technology something that could be resold or worth any value? I, I, I just don't know. I think that there was a lot of off-the-shelf technology that they decided not to go with that I might argue is in a better position. And they chose that, I, I would say, because of the IPO and they wanted to be viewed as a, a tech company and not just a hospitality company. And I know you've talked about that. My position is, you know, they're not a tech company. Um, but with all that said, to go back to your question about, you know, the positives, I, I felt like when I read through a lot of uh, the discussion afterwards, and especially some of the direct messaging coming out of Vacasa, it seemed like they were choosing their words really wisely. It seems like when they choose to indicate that they're up across, you know, a, a majority of the markets compared to other markets, it seems like the way they say that is to imply that at each individual home they're up. But I, I think that what they're trying to say is collectively we're sort of up in that market. And I would suggest that that is because they have the preponderance of units in those markets. And that's why it looks as if they have so many bookings in those particular markets. So, you know, I, I think that any positive that you might take from my perspective, any positive that you might take out of that. I think is is really just choosing words wisely more so than actual positive news. Well, it's interesting that you brought up uh, Resort Quest. I wasn't sure uh, you seem younger, how far you dated back to the industry. But for people who are younger or weren't in the industry back in 2006-ish, um, Resort Quest was a publicly traded company. Um, and it didn't work. Uh, they weren't profitable, but they had started to develop uh, their software. And that was part of the reasons why they said they weren't profitable is they've been investing a huge amount of money into the software, which became B12. They ended up selling it to Instant Software and Instant Software um, put a bit of uh, quite a bit of resources and then they sold it to HomeAway. But V12, ironically, was the uh, enterprise software used by Wyndham um, VR. Wyndham Vacation Rentals, uh, VTrips was on it. We thought it was excellent. Um, and we were disappointed when uh, HomeAway, for reasons that were probably somewhat re related to Verbo, pushed uh, sunsetted um, V12. But at any rate, that's what they did. And, um, you know, the um, contracts were eventually sold to Wyndham VR. So Wyndham VR bought the bulk of the resort quest contracts and then started to do additional m a but you know scott um you know i i do a pretty detailed um analysis on on vacasa and i looked at the third quarter numbers which they tried to finesse which you know good for them but here here's the takeaway i got they their revenue was down nine percent um so, uh, quarter three 2022 versus quarter three but their EBITDA because they did make EBITDA in that quarter was down 79 percent so their EBITDA dropped um significantly and um it went from let me just get it here it went from um EBITDA of 46 million in third quarter 2022 to 26 million in uh third quarter 2023 um, that is a significant drop in EBITDA, and they're currently on an EBITDA projection of 12 months of negative 21 million. Now, they said um, in the earnings call that they think they'll do between five to 10 million. Last uh, fourth quarter, they lost 50 million um, in EBITDA in the fourth quarter. But my my question to you um, is: the fourth quarter <laughs> doesn't look like things are getting any better. Uh, in fact, for us, 
uh, we're really pulling in our our belt because the fourth quarter 2023 looks pretty tough. But what are you seeing in your market? Yeah, so so it, we're seeing the same. I mean, we're starting to see it tighten. And, and to your point, Steve, we're actually we're, all of our planning is around tightening, right? And bracing for whatever this is. I mean, we all know that. It doesn't matter which side of the party lines you're on, especially when election year comes and it really gets in full swing. That puts a lot of people in a moment of pause as well. So so everything I see and everything we're experiencing appears to be slow down, right? And 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 slow down means even looking back to 2019, I think we're gonna we're gonna be below 2019 in some cases because it's just people are getting uncertain and this economy can't people cannot continue at the pace they are in this economy. So I don't see how they're doing this. The only thing I'll say, Steve, and again, this is from us operating very closely next to them in our markets, is just volume, right, in the commodity. Is They uh, they do pull a lot of off-season rentals in, in Ocean City and Delaware, far more than we've ever experienced in the past. But again, Steve, they're doing it at a commodity, right? So they're they're doing $100 nights, just go, 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 and, and as many as they can, as quickly as they can. So I think there's some some way that they drive a little bit of kind of bad revenue, if you will, to, to say, oh, hey, we're still pushing revenue. But to your point, I don't think it's good revenue. I think every, I think everything they're chasing now in Q4, the vast majority of it's going to be bad revenue that's going to cost them later. So, so Adam, the, the headline on the Skift article was about the owner churn. And uh, I've had analysts describe Vacasa as a mighty uh, a melting ice cube, which is not a good term uh, to be called. You, you never want a VC to call you a melting ice cube. Um, so they are describing uh, Vacasa as literally melting away with that owner churn, which they self-described back a year ago at 20%. Um, that was their churn. Now, what they did is they had this organic piece, and more importantly, they had this M&A side um, which they were able to grow the company. And they picked up $400 million through their SPAC um, offering with TPG. And they used the bulk of that $400 million to go out and do massive amount of M&A um, in uh, 2021 and, and 2022. Now they're out of cash. So um, my guess is they are uh, double-digit reducing of, of inventory on a net basis that can't be good for revenue. You, your, your revenue has to start decline if your unit count's declining. I'm, I'm right there with you. And, and that goes back to Scott's point at the beginning of this. And, and he and I talk about this quite a bit. We're trying to understand what the runway is that's left. And I'm sure I would hope there are some analysts out there that are actually looking at what the runway could possibly be. Um, but I would agree. I, th I think that their revenue has got to be shrinking. Their churn numbers are are way too high. Now, I think in the as an industry, we're we're in this position where there's a lot of churn because a it's the time of year, but b we're coming in a the end of a cycle that was booming, and now we're we're coming to some people that are going to have to make hard decisions. It seems like Vacasa is trying to position that uh, as if the homeowners are trying to decide if they're going to rent, and I, I think that that is you know playing to the overall economy and not looking at the their particular operations. I think if you talk to anyone within the industry, they they recognize that their operations are a large reason why those homeowners are leaving, not because they're deciding to sell their home or, or not rent their home. So I, I think that they're playing into the overall economy to try to build that story around why they might be struggling. But the revenue has, has got to be an issue and it's got to be shortening their runway. And it's it gets to the underlying question of, of what comes next, which is is really what I think us as an industry is trying to figure out. Because from my perspective, I'm not overly concerned about what Vacasa the particular entity does. I'm concerned about the overall industry and how does the general public, the traveling public, the in investment groups that are interested in this industry, what is the fallout from Vacasa falling down? If they were the ones that everybody looked to as the ones that were going to be the IPO and the ones that were going to figure out how to actually make this work at scale, how is the industry viewed if they can't make this work? Now, we can talk about how that could unwind and, and how we might position that in a better way, but it's got to be a black eye in the industry at the end of the day. So, so Scott, uh, Vacasa said they had 20% a year owner churn in 2022. Now, VTrips has publicly gone on record and said, hey, our owner churn is nowhere near in 2023 what 2022 was because the number one cause of owner churn is the sale of a property. And we've had far less sales of properties in 2023. I'm curious from your standpoint, do you have more churn in 2023 or less? 
we're, we're less. So we went through the same thing everyone did in 2022, right? Where it, there was a hot market. People were looking and saying, hey, I'm going to sell this and, and upgrade or I'm just going to cash out. But 2023 has all but come to a grind for us. I mean, the, the churn has has stopped. And, and quite honestly, people are looking to figure out how to double down and make sure we're just helping them get through the economy right now. So, um, Adam, I, I'm going to just lay this out for a few minutes so the cash position is really the big problem at Fakasa. Um, their current liabilities are 448 million versus current assets of 352. So they're upside down by almost $100 million current line. 100 million versus current assets. I know last year they talked about this line of credit of 100 million and they've stopped talking about it because my guess is banks are not going to allow them to draw from a line of credit with a balance sheet that looks this bad. Um, the bigger issue for them is now they're heading into the fourth quarter where last year they lost $50 million. And then the first quarter uh, where they lost $12 million. And plus, uh, if their unit count is down, their revenue is going to start to decline. So my guess is they have to find a buyer. That at some point, they're going to run out of cash, right? If they keep losing units, which you know they're, they're basically telling the market they're losing units um, and their revenue is declining, um, they're either going to have to do one of two things, either dramatically reduce costs, which they've done once, and that's partly what's created a lot of this owner churn, or two, find, find a buyer. My question to you, Adam, is as you've talked to people, as you've heard rumors, who would buy Vacasa? I'm I'm trying to figure the same thing out. That's that's the discussion. You know, if you talk about the discussions at at the bar at Verma and those type of things, I think that's the discussion that people are having is who who would the buyer be? Now, what I what I will say is I don't think that's necessarily particular to Vacasa right now. I, I think that there's a lot of discussions about this industry is, you know, who's the next group of investors that's coming in behind any one of these, right? Is it for for vendors? I think there's a lot of people that are sitting there saying, hey, I'm just waiting for that next investor. And I think there's a group of managers who are also waiting for that. And I, I wonder who the next group of investors is for just about anybody in this industry, because I, I think we've gotten to a place where we need to execute. For a long time, there was a lot of people willing to fund things based on the, the projections. And I think we're reaching a point where you've got to produce a revenue. And I, I think that's the hard part for Vacasa right now, to your point. They're short on cash and their revenue is declining. So who wants to step in and take over that business? Is it a liability? Is it a toxic asset? And then to your point, Steve, you have to break it up. And this is what we saw with Resort Quest. So go to go back to that one. Yes, I, I was entering just as that was happening. Being on the Outer Banks, I watched Brinley take back the business from what Resort Quest had, had bought from them. So to see it unravel in that way, I know that it can happen because we, the industry has seen it happen. But that was a different time where people weren't paying attention. There wasn't a lot of news and uh, it wasn't it was something that could go under the radar. And I, I don't know that that's going to happen again. I think it's going to be much more public and I think it's going to be difficult to unravel this. So to answer your question, I don't know who is the group of investors that's willing to put up money to figure that out unless it's just an absolute screaming deal that you can't you can't turn down. Well, I, um, you know, Henrik Helberg of a ways was uh, at the. Uh, BRMA conference speaking at one of the panels with Graham Donahue over at Sykes. And uh, he made the comment that they were not looking to come into the U S market. They'd rather just buy a book of business in Germany or Denmark, but you know, it's not outside of the realm of possibility of imagining a company like platinum equity, which already has the management team in Europe coming in and buying a U.S. firm. But I do think Scott, what would happen? Whoever ends up buying Bacasa, and I've heard some, wild rumors um, about who could potentially buy um, Vacasa. Uh, one of the more interesting is uh, someone from a, a country in Asia. But um, my, I, I think we would be prepared that whoever came in would change the leadership team. That's an obvious. But also they'd start to close. A lot of those units don't make sense, right? I mean, whether it's 40,000, 38,000, 35,000, whatever the unit count they have now, they're spread out in areas that don't make sense. And whoever comes in is going to look at this and say, look, we're only interested in keeping revenue um, producing units. We're not going to keep the ones that cost us money. What What are your thoughts on this? Because you've seen what costs all over the place in your area. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, so so one of the things that I've thought for a while, right, and, and a couple of people have asked, okay, what, what, what would you do to fix it? And, and and it's and it's what you said, Steve. It's so dispersed, right? And it's so chaotic and disorganized. 
I mean, minimally, I'm with you, Steve, where they either have to decide what regions they want to be in and then put a strong team in that region and say, hey, we're going to be strong in these four regions and build leadership in those regions to be on the ground. Or like you're saying, just say, where are we? Where do we want our stronghold? And we're going to operate there and we're going to push the rest out. But I mean, you know, we're working with several owners now that are leaving Vacasa and coming over to us. And Steve, when they're putting in their notice, they're not even getting a response. So they're giving their 90 day notice and then never hearing back from anyone. It's just like, poof, gone. Like, well, I guess we're going, you know, I guess we're okay. We put in notice. We haven't heard from anyone. You guys can start listing the unit now. It, it, it's a, they, they have got to figure out how to get real leadership either locally or at a regional level or else it, it doesn't matter. I mean, we talked about um, at Verma, we talked about their, their high value department, right? So they had a department just set for the high value owners. Um, and essentially now that's from what we understand is down to one or two people. And those people are standing up saying the same thing, like, Hey, listen, I'm trying to call the same people on the ground that the owners are trying to call and I can't get through to them either. Right. I mean, so, so the whole, Oh, just run it remotely. That, that doesn't fly. It just, it doesn't work. All right. Well, we could talk about Picasso all day long, but there's some other public companies that we're going to talk about. Um, and anybody who thinks we're being unfair about Vacasa, take a look at their stock performance and how it looks versus their um, all time low, which when I just looked a, a few minutes ago, it's, it's pretty close. So Airbnb also released earnings just uh, about a week and a half ago. And, you know, Airbnb is viewed, whether the industry likes it or not, as a bellwether for the vacation rental industry. Uh, I don't like it because I, I do not believe Airbnb reflects at least professional property managers. Um, but at any rate, um, you know, what they indicated is uh, 2024 is going to start to slow down. So it was a mixed result. Um, Airbnb closed at $117 a share uh, off its 52 week of $155 a share and um, at about $76 billion market cap. So each partner is worth about $6 billion. So still, uh, they've all done pretty well. But I think one of the, the bigger issues is the stock is really overvalued based on the sector. Um, their um, uh, forward revenue multiple is 77 compared to uh, Booking.com, which is 5.6 uh, multiple, and Expedia, which is 1.8. So my question to you, Adam, and I, I just, I was at BRMA. I looked through the directory. There was not one person at Airbnb with a title other than one director. Everyone else was a lower level person at the largest industry event in the world. W what are your thoughts? What do you hear about Airbnb? I mean, I'm 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 biased like you, Steve, right? I don't I don't think that they represent the vacation rental industry and especially not the professional vacation rental industry. I think that for a long time, we as an industry have allowed them to do what they're going to do because we liked the dollars they were spending and we liked the attention that they were able to bring into the market. But I think that times are changing. And I, I think that there's a, a number of variables that are coming together that are going to create the headwinds that we're all experiencing. And it's, a, it's an opportunity for us professional managers to grab the wheel and start focusing again on, on our marketing, on our direct bookings and bring that back to us. Now, as far as, you know, my perspective on, on Airbnb, I think that they, they were valuable for a while. And I think that at this point, they're actually more of a hindrance to us as professional managers than anything else. And, and what my perspective is, is that they are trying to dictate this market, right? If you look at the features that they're rolling out, they are trying to become a de facto PMS for all of the unprofessional managers. So it, 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 if I extrapolate this a little bit further, I think that Airbnb, the model that they created helped to create an inflated real estate market. All of the reasons that we're, we're on, uh, the challenges that we're on right now, as far as high prices, uh, as far as a lack of sales, as far as challenges with the homeowners coming with reduced reservations and with reduced revenue and the challenges that they're going to have to make hard decisions coming into 24 about whether or not they, need, they can make their mortgage payments. I think that is all coming at us. And I think that stems from Airbnb's model. I think that they made it way too easy to become hosts. 
And that's the line that they're going on. If you look at the features that they're releasing, they want to make it easier and easier. And the only way that they maintain that stock value going forward is to continue to put more homes into Airbnb, more hosts into Airbnb. And I don't think that's the right path for this industry. The other side of this is regulations. And I know, Steve, you're, you're big on the advocacy side. I think that if, if we were to look back 10 years ago and just watch the growth of what the vacation, the professional vacation rental management was at that time, I think we could have been very sensible about regulations. I think we missed that opportunity for the same reason as, uh, as the real estate side. I think Airbnb made it way too easy for people who don't understand the industry, people who are who lack the professionalism to go out and, and run a professional management company. And as a result, the industry started to get bad reputations in communities and more and more regulation started to come. If you look at what's happening around the world, and New York City is, is the prime example, but it's happening in a lot of different places. The fact that they are, are banning Airbnb, and, and just be clear, when they say banning Airbnb, that's banning vacation rentals, that is a direct uh, relation to the way that Airbnb has built their model and, and run their model. And in my mind, that is a directly antagonistic to who we are as an industry. And to your point, Steve, they're not even coming to the table to have discussions with us. They're not going to Burma. They're not opening themselves to having these discussions to try to figure out how we can work together. I feel like they're trying to dictate where we should all be going. And us as professional managers should start to, to recognize that and, and act accordingly. So there's a lot there to unpack. Um, what I what I would say, and I've said it before, you know, this is not a startup company anymore. Airbnb is is not a startup, right? So I think some of what happened in the past, you know, they were kind of given a pass um, on their behavior because they were a startup. They are now worth $71 billion. They're sitting on $4 billion of cash. Um, you know, this is not a startup. It's inexcusable, some of the things that have occurred. Um, and I would view it as in part because of their leadership, which is still the original founding um founder, Brian Chesky is still there and his kind of weird ideas of, of the industry and shared homes at the expense of whole home inventory. But Scott, I'm curious, do you list Airbnb and uh, your properties on Airbnb? If so, how big of a component is that? Yeah. So, so that's the easy road for us. We, we don't use Airbnb. We, we, we will refuse to do business with them. We use them um, as we were coming into COVID. And then when when they took the approach they did in COVID, we we've never gone back. I mean, if if you look at the model, right? I mean, what it appears is Jesse's going to do everything in his power to get the guests all on his side, right? Now he's going to force better pricing, right? He's going to make this a commodity, and and he just wants to build the guest side, and and really it's it's the owner owners and, and these these poor guys that are trying to run businesses through Airbnb. I mean. The struggle that they're about to face is going to be monumental, but they're they're just going to squeeze this industry from commoditizing it, getting all of the guests on, on their side, and then just squeeze everyone below. Yeah. So, Adam, um, there was an article that was just released um, in Bloomberg, I think, two days ago, where uh, Brian Chesky is interviewed, and he says Airbnb is fundamentally broken. And he's going to fix it, right? So the guy who broke it is now going to fix it, right? So that's kind of the irony there. But I mean, back to all of this, I think if you look at Airbnb's trajectory, right, they have been adamant about not supporting professional property managers, making it much more difficult to prop professional property managers to operate. And even on the advocacy level, um, advocate, advocating for shared homes at the expense of full home inventory, even when they cause a lot of the disruptions in the neighborhoods. So, you know, my question to you is, at what point do professional property managers uh, organize themselves and go directly to the leadership at Airbnb and, and basically tell them, hey, look, start to change the way you're behaving or we're going to pull the plug? I think that's a great, great question, Stephen. I, I think we we've missed that opportunity a long time ago. I mean, I, I think it, that discussion should have happened a long time ago, and we've given them a, a lot of momentum to ignore us at this point. And to Scott's point, their their focus is not on on hosts. Their focus is on guests, right? They they want to be uh, sort of an asset light, focused on guests, get that loyalty, which no one in this industry has done well, and and I'm sure that they're going to try to do it. 
but that's not going to be loyal to host. That's going to be loyal to Airbnb. And, and to Scott's point about everyone who's who's building their businesses off of Airbnb, they need to recognize that Airbnb does not have the best interest of any one of those hosts in mind. They're looking for the guests. They're not going to have the best interest in the hosts. So I think that the challenge becomes how do we as an industry start to talk about the changes that are ahead? And I don't think that we're having enough real discussions and the discussions that we're trying to have are being stifled because we can't define who we are and what are what we're trying to accomplish. And I, I tried to have a little bit of this discussion on, on uh, LinkedIn this week. I was trying to define short-term rental versus vacation rental in a way that we could start to think about what is the difference. And there is. I, th I think there's a fundamental difference in the model. I think that if I was to define it, short-term rentals would be someone who's trying to to maximize that asset in the best way that they can. And I would view the people who are relying on Airbnb as sort of falling into that camp. You're trying to use an OTA to get as many stays through that property as you possibly can, be as hands-off as, as you can. Now, I'm generalizing. I'm sure that there are some, some strong vacation rental managers in that group. But the other side, the vacation rental managers are really trying to build a strong relationship with the homeowners, a strong relationship with those guests. They're trying to get loyal guests. They're trying to build guest loyalty. So I think there's a lot of opportunity because we got lazy over the last few years for that relationship with the guests and homeowners, for that loyalty. But I think the, the bigger challenge is we've got this divide that we can't even define as an industry. We've got this divide of people that are so reliant on Airbnb that they drowned out the voices of people who are trying to say, hey, they're not operating in our best interests. So I think one of the things we need to do is, is actually have some real discussions, which is going to be challenging. But I also think that we need to listen to the people that are giving us information and try to understand what their incentives are. Why is Airbnb telling us that they're so strong? Why is Vacasa telling us that they're so strong? They've got incentive behind that to make us believe that's the case. We need to look back and figure out why are they saying it and then try to figure out what are the next steps around that. I, I think that we've missed that opportunity to talk to Airbnb personally. I, I think that I don't know that they're going to pay attention to us unless they have really strong headwinds. Uh, because right now, I, I think that they believe they're in control. Hopefully, we can wrestle that control back, but I think that's their belief. Well, Adam, I'm a little bit more optimistic. So um, this brings me um, to the next topic, which is, you know, this industry is good at identifying problems. It's a good at virtue signaling and clapping hands and, and talking about how great companies are, even when they're not. Uh, but in terms of like formulating a plan, you know, to something that's clearly a problem, which I think most people in the industry would recognize that Airbnb is a problem for professional managers. Um, it's a problem also for advocacy. And it's a problem where the leadership is just out of tune with um, professional property managers' views, values. Um, so the alternative is, yes, we could go to Airbnb and say, if you don't change your behavior, we'll pull the plug. We all recognize that's unrealistic because so many companies are dependent on their revenue. They're not going to do that. The alternative is having another channel that can threaten Airbnb. So that channel, let me just talk about a channel that should terrify Airbnb. And that channel is called Booking.com. Now, a lot of people in the U.S. market probably don't realize how strong Booking.com is because most people in the U.S. market still probably remember Expedia and Airbnb is quite strong in the U.S. market. But in Europe, Booking.com dominates the market. And um, even though Airbnb came into Europe, here's some stats for you. In 2021, Airbnb had 48% of the property management share um, of, of OTA volume. In 2023, that had dropped to 41%. Booking.com had 30% of the market share in uh, 2021. That's now up to 43%. So Booking.com is now in a more dominant position than Airbnb in Europe among professional property managers. And meanwhile, um, Booking.com has a stock value of 3,020 per share, um, near their 52-week high of $3,200. And that's not just a 52-week high, that's an all-time high. If you've looked, uh, it used to be called Priceline, it's now called Booking.com. It's it's probably the, uh, the best stock in the travel sector uh, over the last 15 years, no question about that. Their multiple is not quite as strong as Airbnb, but it's getting close at 5.6 times forward revenue multiple. Now, here's the thing. There was a reason why Ben Harrell 
was at uh, a, a general open uh, session at, at VRMA. And that's because behind the scenes, I got him invited. And he was on stage saying how not only did he want to get more involved um, with professional property managers, he'd even be involved in advocacy. And it's not a coincidence at all that Track TNS is going to have a direct connection with Booking.com, which has been a real problem in the U.S. market, not having a direct connection. And so that's supposed to happen on January 1st. 2024, direct connection with booking.com. So my question to you, Scott, is do you use booking.com? And if not, is it because of the difficulty working with channel managers on the booking.com channel? So so we got started with them actually, Steve. So so it, it came up um and and we were a hard no on on Airbnb, but then folks who were working with said, hey, we we can go ahead and connect with booking. And you know, like like you mentioned Steve I hadn't really paid much attention to them because they're they're just not not so well known but I'll tell you I mean and I, I don't have the the stats but we've seen quite a few bookings from booking.com and, and they're solid they seem to be solid partners to work with I hadn't considered that they they can give Airbnb a run for the money but I'm with you I, I think if they can come alongside and at least threaten to say we're going to do this and we're going to partner with the professional side I, th- I think there's something real to this yeah, so Adam, um, our uh, third quarter OTA uh, mix was 14% for Booking.com versus 7% the previous year. So we really bolster them. Now, Airbnb is still at 22% uh, and HomeAway VRBO is at 51%. But, you know, I, I think the Booking.com numbers are going to start to come at the cost of, of Airbnb over time. And, uh, you know, Booking.com, um, Glenn Fogel lives in New York. Uh, the CEO of Booking.com. The U.S. market is a huge emphasis for Booking.com. Here's some other information. I know you guys like data. Um, So of uh, the most downloaded travel apps worldwide, Airbnb came in fourth place with 52 million downloads. The company's competitor, Booking.com, came in third place with 80 million downloads. That's per Apptopio. And some would say, well, that's great. That's worldwide. In the U.S. market, uh, 17 million downloads for Booking.com in 2022 versus 13 million for Airbnb in 2022. So even the younger generation is downloading more Booking.com apps than Airbnb apps. And it's because you can book everything on Booking.com. You can book cruises, cars, hotels, pensions, um, you name it, it's all there. Whereas obviously Airbnb is just vacation rentals. And the thing that Airbnb used to say about Verbo is that Verbo was a mature uh, marketplace. I think Booking.com can now say to Airbnb, you're mature too. Your customers are literally going to age out. So Adam, I'm just curious. You've heard a lot about Booking.com. What's your perspective at this point? I, I think it's great. I, I think you're 100% right. Um, I think that the competition will will get people's attention. Whether or not that changes Chesky's tune of guests versus property managers, I don't know. But it, it will make him start to think about uh, how he how he approaches the, the industry and the market a little bit differently. The only thing I will say, and, and I, I agree, I think we've seen the, the growth from booking. We've also seen a decline in Expedia, right? And I, I think that if you look at those two together, they're actually the same reason. I think that booking put more marketing dollars towards the US. Expedia took marketing dollars off the table. And I think that's why we've seen this growth. So if booking can continue to justify the marketing dollars that they put into the U.S. market, then yes, I think that we're going to continue to see that growth. And I don't see any reason why they can't. You know, I, I'm not sure why they were backing off the U.S. market, but they did for a while. And I think it might have been around that COVID period where they weren't putting the focus in, into the U.S. market. So I, I think if they still see the value and they continue to put the marketing dollars into this U.S. market, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't continue to take market share away from Airbnb. And I, th- I think your your point there is, is spot on. I think that having a full travel hub, you know, a place where you can go and do all of your travel needs, which is what Airbnb thinks they're going to get to at some point. I, I think that's a, a bold a bold dream that they've got considering all of the, the challenge they have in front of them. But there's a huge value for the traveling public to look at booking for for their maturity, their growth, their their wealth of options. Um, so yeah, I, I'm bullish on them, especially if they can continue to put the marketing dollars behind it. Yeah. So Scott, um, Adam just talked about Expedia VRBO, and that was the next company I wanted to talk about. And we've noticed a, a sizable decrease in in Verbo. And 
you know, interestingly enough, leadership hasn't been very open as to why uh, we're seeing the decline in revenue. Now, my speculation is that they are trying to migrate all of the VRBO inventory to the Expedia.com channel. Um, and ultimately, that Expedia.com channel will become the marketplace, and Verbo will literally be a mature company like some of the other companies within the uh, Expedia portfolio. But they've no question, Verbo has backed away from um, marketing dollars, uh, and it's it's definitely caused a collapse. Um, are are you seeing the same thing in your market? And if so, what are you doing? Yeah, so, so that, that's been a big part of ours, Steve, is, is watching them back off. And, and again, after after what was, they, they were coming at it pretty hot and heavy. I mean, for, for us, Steve, it, it is just trying to push direct, right, and, and trying to differentiate ourselves uh, locally. I mean, it is, we have the value of, we're, we're a strong repeat market, right? We've, we've got, it's, it's basically the, the areas around us. So we're just trying to blanket the areas and get our name out there. But yeah, I mean, the, the VRBO of this year is nothing compared to what it's been. I mean, it is, they're a fraction of, of, of what they've contributed in the past. I mean, now we're just trying to differentiate ourselves. And, and really, the, the only other monster we're facing is really is, is the Vicasa piece, right? And, and and trying to not do the commodity run with them and, and trying to not make this all about pricing to, to generate bookings. But But VRBO is not who they once were. Well, Vacasa's issue is it's not pricing, it's cash flow. Uh, I think they're blowing inventory out to get cash so they don't run out of cash so they can make payroll. But <laughs> a- Adam, I'm curious because, uh, and and again, you know, Verbo hasn't been very good at articulating long-term strategies. I think they gave up after, um, you know, John Kim left the company. Uh, some of the things he said were just, just incredible. Um, in Charlotte, North Carolina was kind of his big... Uh, debut of all the grand schemes that uh, he had in store for VRBO. Uh, But let's talk about reality. Let's assume that the rumors we're hearing are true, that once VRBO moves everything over to Expedia uh, and Expedia gets that inventory, Expedia is going to start to operate a lot like Booking.com and is going to put their promotional money behind Expedia and OneKey and, and all of that. And Verbo, for lack of a better term, becomes kind of the mature piece that eventually literally dies away or melts away. My question to you is, what's the integration plan with Expedia? Because I'm not even aware that there is much of one. I know Track TNS, I kind of strong-armed Expedia to get an integration, and it took forever. It looks like maybe April 1. But what are you hearing? Because, I mean, if if this is the case... And the marketing is shifting to Expedia.com. I would uh, I would have thought there would be a direct integration with Expedia with all the major software companies in the U.S. market. Well, I, I think you're you're scratching the surface on on another big issue, not just with Expedia, but in the industry as a whole. And it's it's integrations, uh, and it's a a stifling of innovation. It's a lack of forethought, uh, and and it's it's a shame because you've been talking about this for years. The industry has been talking about this for years. Property managers want open APIs where we can easily integrate different products and different solutions across all of these different platforms, and legacy PMSs are slowing that down. Now, as far as why Expedia hasn't figured that out, I don't know. I mean, is that that, you know, they're not thinking through the vacation rental space? They, they should have enough background here to understand that integrations are going to be an absolute necessity if you're going to force everybody off of VRBO and onto Expedia. That should be one of the first plans you have in place is how do we walk down the path of making sure that all the integrations are here? And it feels like when I look at the, the software climate or the, the vendor climate, as much as they are trying to uh, push pro- uh, positive solutions back to the property manager that can really uh, potentially make their life easier, the challenge is that they're looking at their solution as a point solution and not thinking about how it's going to impact the overall ecosystem of the industry. And we need people to start thinking about how it impacts the entire industry. I think that at this point, and I'm not sure who's going to get there or how it's going to get there, I think that we need some sort of middleware that is going to help connect all of these pieces, whether it's a a headless PMS or a middleware. I don't think marketplaces work. I think marketplaces don't solve uh, the ownership issue. I think everybody's pointing their fingers in marketplaces. It's it's everybody else's issue. Maybe a a sort of 
integration across different communities works. I'm not sure, but I, I think that there is a lack of forethought and innovation around integrations and how to get different products working together. Well, that's a long answer. I know it's something we thought a lot about when V12 was sunsetting and uh, we did an RFP uh, and, and at the top of the list was open API. Now we ended up going with TNS track. I'm telling you what, managing API is not fun, but you can do it. Um, and, and we've used our size and leverage and the fact that there's a bunch of other enterprise companies on track TNS to, to leverage booking.com and, and Expedia to build out direct connections. But I mean, this is a huge issue. And I mean, I was talking to somebody who's still on Escapian and I said, look, you know, do you, uh, do you think they're going to build out an API for booking.com? And he said, no, no way. That's a big problem. I mean, that that is a real big problem. So we're going to get to the lightning round as we get close to the, to the end of the uh, the podcast. And um, I'm going to ask you, Scott, um, for an answer on Marriott Home and Villas. Where are you at? Man, so, so so I'm actually I probably sit on the other side of the fence from you on this one, Steve. So we we've we've used it well in a couple of our operations, but what we've found is you, you've got to be closer to home base, right? So so we have a, a operation here on the eastern shore in Maryland, and we're seeing a lot of the users coming from DC and from New York City, right? And and putting it putting it to use for us. So I don't know that it's brought us a lot of exposure from extra eyes. Uh, looking at us, but I do think that we have found value in in some of the users you putting it to use, putting it to to good work for them, and then becoming a guest or coming back to us next year on 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 their own dime. So I'm I'm a little bit uh, more optimistic on it than you, but I don't think it's it's always cracked up to be Steve as far as it's going to be something that really bolsters this whole new channel. So Adam, um, did you spend any time talking to the folks over at American Express? hotels collection who are you did not very interesting you know they're coming into the industry and they're going to actually be uh doing curated inventory and the inventory will actually display on american express as a tab you know with marriott you have a banner which i think has been a big problem um as opposed to you know an integration with all the homes uh, and and villas in your market showing up whenever you do a search like Gatlinburg, you know there's like three Marriott hotels in Gatlinburg. There's hundreds of cabins, but all that shows up is a banner. So with um, American Express um, uh, hotels collection, which you can use your membership reward points for, um, it's going to show up as a tab similar to car rentals, um, hotels, air, and I think even cruises is a tab. And the other thing is you can use your points on a one-to-one -one basis. So there's not even a discount of points. So, um, you know, it was really easy. We didn't, unlike Marriott, we weren't asked to sign a 50 page contract. We weren't told to only provide hotel exclusivity for Marriott rate parity, all this other nonsense that Marriott wanted. And we were allowed to pick and curate the inventory. So we picked about 500 properties that we thought were truly luxury in you know mix of markets and we provided it back to them and it was a pretty easy process but um so that that's that's how we we handled that um i'm curious scott are you using homes to go we we are it, it it's been it's been a slow start and there's actually this week we had an issue with them and i started to question if anyone was on the other end because we we had an issue and then they tried to answer and then we never heard back from them but but it's been it's been a little plug-in, but it's been slow. And and again, I just I'm not sure who's really over on the other side. Well, I got their attention by disconnecting them, and then all of a sudden they were all animated. But I think you know the the volume just decreased. We were getting forty to fifty bookings per month from them, which is okay. Um, by July, it was down to five, and I think what happened was a lot of their um, rev, uh, the money that they had that they got from their um, public offering dried up and they weren't spending money on pay-per-click and other things. So uh, they claim that they have fixed things. We're going to give them a try, but like Hopper, um, it just wasn't really worth it. Uh, I'll be curious to see how things go. Um, Adam, I'm I'm curious on another topic and that's purpose-built inventory. Um, where are you at with purpose-built? Because obviously um, 
I've been actually putting my own resources in the purpose built. I sent you a couple of links of some purpose built properties we've done. I mean, product to me is the thing that none of us talk about. We we talk about revenue, we talk about OTAs, but we never talk about the product. And, and in some cases, that's the first thing we should be talking about is the product. Where are you at with purpose built inventory? I agree. I think product is is often left out of the discussion. And and Scott and I talk about this a lot. I think we need to choose the right product and the right homeowners for whatever your your model is. And I think that purpose built um, is is a great way to find the right product. And whoever happens to be owning that product clearly is buying it with the intent of putting it back into that vacation rental space. So I, I think the recipe makes a lot of sense to me. What I what I question in this industry. Uh, is a lot of these groups that are going out and acquiring a lot of these homes to own. And uh, and they're looking at it from the perspective as if it's something new. And when I look at that, I think, look, we've been doing this for a very long time. It's not as if anybody hasn't thought, hey, what if I own a bunch of these homes? I think it's adding a tremendous amount of risk back into this industry. And if you look at what the hotels do, um, you know, they're, they're asset light and they're focused on their guest list. And, and we talk in this industry a lot about the value of, of the contract of the home. And I think we, we uh, lose sight of the value of that guest list. And, and we need to get back to building guest lists, building loyalty, focusing on the marketing side of things. But when I think about purpose built, I, that fits right in there. My only issue with the purpose built is I don't necessarily, and I don't think this is what you're doing with it, Steve, but I don't necessarily think it's, it's a great model to, to build a lot of these homes and then try to hold them as if, uh, oh, well, we own the inventory, so it's going to be much easier for us to operate. I think, yes, you're going to make quicker decisions, but I think the long-term challenges and long-term risk that you've now built into that business model is pretty significant. But as a whole, I'm, I'm bullish on purpose-built. I, I love the concept. Yeah, you're kind of talking about two different things. So there's purpose-built, building the inventory to suit a vacation rental as opposed to taking a, a second home and retrofitting it into a vacation rental. And then you're yep. talking about who who ultimately owns the asset would it be a REIT or uh, a company that's coming in and buying assets and how would they effectively manage it uh you know there's a company called highgate which is massive out of india that is trying to do it in the u.s market uh, they've had limited success there's been some press releases um, about a couple other companies that are coming in to buy assets i know avant stay raised the fund uh, they did not uh, manage things well in that fund uh they pulled kind of the plug uh so there's been different attempts to get in uh professional uh institutions owning assets and holding it i think there are some ideas or theories that in particular money from outside the us would come in and hold um investment real estate as an asset um because it would be a protection against their own currency the question is really um, they need it on a scale that is hard because they can't have one here, one there. They they need to have it in a place that's that's uh, kind of gives them density. But we'll see how this goes. I mean, there there is a lot of money on the sidelines. The U.S. market in particular is attractive to international investors because of the strength of U.S. property laws, the strength of the dollar, the strength of the overall U.S. economy as a hedge against their potential country they're in where they could have currency fluctuations. So, Scott, I'm going to leave the last lightning round question to you. Um, and I didn't really prep you on it, but you have a sign behind you. So I've said some bad things about the franchise model. I, I get it. You know, I don't like the fact that uh, what I've heard is it's hard to get out of that contract, that franchise contract, and that when you try to sell your business, which is the idea that everybody has in their head, someday I want to sell this business, you're kind of, it's very, very difficult because the only way you can sell it is to another person that wants to buy the franchise. But maybe you've had some um, different ideas, maybe you had a different experience. So I kind of want to give you the floor to rebut this or give me some color. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's good. And, and I appreciate you bringing it up. So obviously, Steve, you and I are on the different side of this. Um, and I'll start by saying the the entire Casago team, right? I, I enjoy every one of them, right? From Steve Schwab, Ryan Dame, Alex, and the whole crew. So so I started out with the, the personal connection with them. And then really, Steve, we got in because of community, right? And then I do believe they've built a very strong community and I like the idea of the national presence, and I think it's I think it's val valid. I think there's there's value to it, um, but but for me, this is a long term game, right? So I'm not looking. I'm not I'm not one of the guys that are looking to come in and and build it up and sell it. And and you know, Adam and I aligned on that pretty early on to say we're in, right? So Steve, I've got a if 
five-year-old at home and a three-year-old. So, so I've locked myself into, I'm going to be working for a little bit longer. So, so for me, I didn't really look at the, the contract and I agree with you in everything you said about always making sure that you check the contract to see what you're signing up for. But yeah, I, I'm a Casago fan. I'm a Casago supporter. Um, and I know that, that, that you question the model for me, it works very well for us. Um, it makes sense for what we're trying to do. And again, on the people side, I'm a, I'm a big supporter of that, of that group. All right. Well, I think we all agree that before you sign a contract, you probably want to have legal representation Absolutely. Uh, just to, to make sure you're not getting into something uh, or if the company, the franchise and uh, leave it vague, because there's a couple different franchise models out there. If they're not providing you the services uh, that you think they should, or you thought you agreed to that you have a way to terminate. Uh, that's just good common sense advice. So get an attorney. Uh, there's attorneys that even on my LinkedIn page, I sometimes reference attorneys for franchise agreements. So um, mm-hmm. any rate, I appreciate both Scott and Adam being on uh, Straight Fire VR. Uh, this has been a great episode. Anybody who would like to watch the episode um, or future or current or previous episodes, go to straightfirevr.com or you can uh, email me at straightfire. VR at gmail.com. Thank you again, Scott, Adam, and Heather. Bye.